are now going to welcome uh, Hengpi Huo, who is joining us from Hawaii at the moment. Um, we have all sorts of travel visa kinds of issues um, this year, so uh, luckily we have this technology. Let's hope it all works again as it did with Selena. So uh, Hengpi Huo is an archaeologist and project director at the International uh, Research Institute uh, in Honolulu. He received his PhD in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, and before that, he completed a bachelor's degree in archaeology in 2002 from the Royal University of Fine Arts in Phnom Penh. Uh, Pipal's research interests lie in archaeological political economy, settlement patterns, state formation, and ceramic production and consumption. I'm also very happy to say that, uh, that Pipal has joined the editorial board of the, uh, of the NUS, the National University of Singapore Press and SOAS publication series, which we, are, which we have launched recently on the uh, ancient to pre-modern Hindu Buddhist art of Southeast Asia. So I will uh, ask Pipal now to uh, say hello to everyone while we can still see you. <laughs> and to switch your switch your screen now so that we can follow your slides, which you can control directly. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Morning from Honolulu. Morning. Very morning. <laughs> oh, now I can. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Ashley, and all for the invitation to participate in this um, um, occasion. I apologize, I can't make it to uh, London to see everyone, but Skype offer uh, an alternative to, uh, um, <coughs> to not sharing um, what is the case. So, I'll suggest that I put together a short presentation on my experience, my perspective, on publication related to art and archaeology of Cambodia. So, I hope that my experience is an example of, to what I have done. And again, it's not a magic pill to uh, publication, but it offers it offer an example, and and um, some of it might be useful to some of you in, in the audience. Let me try now sharing my screen. from this presentation. Can everyone see it? Because I cannot see it. Yeah, yeah. All right. So I have several key points I'd like to make. Um, for this presentation, I would like to start with, with the academic tradition, with the training. Publication um, has to be based on perspective, on, on academic tradition. So we we will start with the school of education training. Then my second point is who are the audience? What what are the purpose of writing? And what's venue for presentation and, and publication? My third point is to teach about our language, to think of our medium of communication, since all the research articles. Um, then lastly, I will start to collaborate. I think the last point is that it has been an important um, aspect of, of my Um, so to begin with, um, as most of you are uh, familiar with, um, with Argo, I don't have to, to talk about it too much. 
but but the research in in PMP and art history or history in Cambodia began with the, the colonial um, so colonial approach. So we have all these um, these scholars, uh, and scholars that who jump start um, whole field history, archaeology, art history, and so on. So only these early publications involved the um, survey of local farms. The site descriptions and um, this gentleman on on the left hand side, Abi Malaclair, he he write he wrote more about human traditions, Buddhism. So uh, he was an early uh, and then on your right with the um, Francis Daniel, which. Who was part of of Nepal exploration? And other scholars, other including Aimonie on your left and and Louis de la Zon on your right, were really the first to do the systematic um, inventory survey for Aimonie. Um, southern Vietnam and northeastern China. But my point here is that uh, our academic tradition is based on pretty much this approach. So, inventory survey, um, documentation of site, and presentation. Um, <clears throat> In the past, Heritage on an ideology and politics is a was uh, intimately linked. And that I'm not saying that it only happened in the past, it also happened in the present. In this case, we could see that um, the Franco Siam Treaty in 1907, we can we kind of see with Manama. To, uh, has a political statement that the presentation of, of uh, um, our history, in this case, from Alco, was indicated that used as a as, as evidence of uh, Cambodian territory. So, when you preach, and uh, and 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 politics meant and use in in political statements. So in this case, it gives legitimacy to the Cambodian state as well as the colonial uh, uh, power. So we see that in in um, French territory, uncle of Bayan was used on banknotes on your left as a banknote from New Caledonia from 1944 that's a payout is there and on your right it's a banknote from Indochina that is in Indochina from 1939 and they did take uncle under then Another aspect of, of um, early research involved competition and to point out the obvious. Siam Society was created in 1904 and three years after that, the uncle, Society Uncle, the Uncle Society was created in 1907 for similar purposes. So the the rivalry between uh, political power yeah, and France involved this kind of state using um, research material using archaeology or using heritage. 
So we'll, we'll move on to the post-independence of Southeast Asia. So there will be a lot of view. Heritage is just intended to use in a way that they carry political statement, carry the diplomacy of um, either the Cambodian state or the this case one. But post independent or post colonial independence of East Asia and then Cambodia, you'll see that the heritage, the symbol of nation, the symbol of nationalism, that's just a, a snapshot as, uh, from Wikipedia in this case. We could see the flags, the Cambodian flags from the 19th century until until now. Uncle has depicted on our flags. It's linked between heritage and and nationalism as a nation. So research in different views will find an audience to um, to make a statement of nation, make a statement of national identity. Um, we could say the same thing with with um Fukushima if they are in Thailand. We could say the same thing about uh, the Dong Sen Kung Chong, the Dong Dong Sen Kung Vietnam, the Dodo in Java and Spokane in Burma. So in, during this period um, in, in Cambodia, there were a lot of, of publications in Cambodia in Thailand that targeted Cambodians using Uncle as a case that in the past this is. This was how we um, became an, an, an empire, for example. So, it, heritage um, was used for research on heritage was used as a case to uh, prop up national pride. Then. For the current purpose, I would like to talk about the purpose of writing in general. So I hope uh, um, <clears throat> for the past few slides, um, I, I have made a statement about the use of research um, to target specific things. So from a colonial period, we have a look at Particularly with the general public at home of France, for example. So, generate knowledge at home, provide the democracy, the uh, uh, French protectorate in Cambodia. In the same time, it provides the democracy for the French protectorate over Cambodia, because Cambodia heritage as power then. In the independent period, that audience shifted to national consumption. So, top, top that identity construction is natural. Have that um, point in mind as a researcher, research acts what out of the right, what do we intend to write about? Why and uh, how do we go about doing our research? What type of research? Search documentation, comparative analysis, and who are our kind of audience? Who are we talking? Um, Cambodians or my studies or Will our research fit into Southeast Asian studies? Or our intended audience 
postdoctoral students of the same fields, meaning that our research, our publication, is intended to generate conversations and the advancement of the field of archaeological history. Or whether we want to accept in a public outreach country, the general public, to know the info, to the information about our research um, of, of the field to the general public. So in a sense then, my perspective on writing, my scope of writing, would be something like so, a trans detail of alignment of this adding element. We could take that as a regional premise. You have to see the whole picture. Otherwise, you only dislike part of that picture or whatever you want to make. But my view on this is that if our research as quest for knowledge, so it's accumulated to time. We could use this this um, example here um, <clears throat> an, analog, an analogy to having both field search or multiple uh, uh, um, modules in describing uh, uh, a research question and, and understanding a research question in solving a research question. So, with multiple um, methodology, multiple approaches, it is this, this issue we can describe the whole issue. And then, another perspective on research is the purpose of of our research purpose, our publication is accumulation of knowledge. We don't write a part, we don't write part of product. We write peace, we write a contribution to a general body of research. It is a saying that standing on a, a giant. So the more research we have, more contribution everyone uh, put in to the same field, the better the next one will be. So that 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 is my my perspective on search and competition. And I think that what what has been useful to me uh, so far is writing for a larger audience. Like larger audience can be the Cambodian public, but it can be um, researchers, scholars, students of the same field that, that or whose interest lies in a, a cultural comparative, cross-cultural comparative theme. In this case, um, <coughs> we could shift our research focus to beyond in the set descriptions, but put the general site to conceptual framework. We could shift our uh, research from talking about influence from a higher culture to interaction with the culture. So that eliminates a hierarchy of of uh, of um, the mix. So that everyone can talk, or we can continue to talk about the general scope of Southeast Asian studies, uh, championed by Zhao uh, Zedong. Or, or we could continue to talk about the Indian uh, perspective on art and uh, religion of Southeast Asia, for example. Then we could move beyond that to talk about uh, uh, <clears throat> a general theme. So in the 60s and 70s, Bagna Philippe Bourrier was um, 
a famous archaeologist, actually he's the only archaeologist so far who went real archaeologist who worked in Africa. But his hydraulic hypothesis, his work in Africa relating to exploitation of the land, the water and its, rich, and its relationship with, with agriculture, for example, that contributes to a general hydraulic Hypothesis that is the best one. So this research not only due to the research of itself, but it comes to a great field, greater understanding of what is the relationship between in civilization and water management. Another cross-cultural themes I found interesting so far that I put no repeat. As themes of recent to Buddhism and Buddhism, because that theme in general, we don't describe it. Mean, it's not necessarily a religious study, but it's it's a culture, it's cultural adaptation. So we could talk about Buddhism in, in, in Thailand, as a version of Buddhism in Cambodia, how that fits. That how this body of I or Burmese adapted to why it is so different, or how similar are they? And in, in archaeology, the themes become this overarching theme, for example, Neolithic, Iron Age, and Bronze Age. So our research. Contribute to this larger theme so we can find a, a larger audience. <clears throat> That's the example that I have to, to go with is a product here in Apple. Um, <clears throat> another way to approach uh, our, our research is through methods. So on your left, is photos of Gilgit's excavation in Tlatla in 1964. You see a series of square trenches, these are five by five meters trenches, and uh, it was invented by by uh, more time or so more time for you from the UK. It was popular at that time as far as the uh, Roman research in the Roman sites. Because it's high in structures, and it was the employed for the first time by Gilgit And currently, on your right, uh, is the application of LIDAR technology in, in Alpha. So, methods like that has, has a great public interest. So, our research could contribute to. to uh, Advancement of the field you know, to um, the marketing and improvement of the field. We could talk about cultural contact. So, this is just a theme of, of uh, propagation of Hinduism and Buddhism. How would our research fit into the so our research is, is not site. It's not what village or grand location in Cambodia. Like the our research could offer large uh, interaction. And we have that example from our experience the Robert Brown, UCLA, from KU Mountain, of the LFAO. Also, Paul Lavi of the University of Hawaii and Milo. So, we could talk about regional interaction, a similarity. So, the, the, the premises, the premises of the research is that early uh, Buddha statues, Vishnu statues, or Shiva Lipkum share similarities across Southeast Asia. The Maya band. The prototype from India, for example, the one on the right, um, 
Guam Peninsula, Thailand, that could have been the prototype imported directly from India, but soon after that, it's that cross Southeast Asia with Southeast Asia. That characteristics. This thing could be said about the uh, Buddha statues dated between the 6th and 7th century or 8th century. Then we could talk about archaeology. Did the study for beads using um, methods like IACPMS um, to identify chemical or fingerprint beads? So we could trace this to the consensus. So this example from Alison Carter, um, her research on beads, we could trace the input of trace the origins of these beads to a start in Asia, to East Asia, and some to local Asia. But the, the research on beads on each side levels and interactions across this region. So it's, it's it would help put our research in a regional perspective on trade. Or we could use an example from Downson Rock, how is that you just both spread across that data? So our research is concentrated that if the research happened to be different. The yeah, Now move on to uh, the Asian menu. So, so far in, in Cambodia, our, our um, publication menu has been uh, Buddhist Institute. It's one of the oldest journals. And really, we have some Cambodian students in, in the the FAO version of the author paper concept, or some who have published the version of, of the FAO in Cambodia, and that he has an entire book and various annual of uh, organizations working in the market. So it is journal different themes, different audience, and the article that was published intended the purpose of the history. But you could do that from all of this, that multiple activities is by Cambodians, English, French, and also Chinese. I think there are some Italians or, or um, Chinese. And so far, my experience of of developing uh, research has been writing for conference. So my incentive here is that my my writing for to a panel to a within, within the conference within a, 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 a panel, the conference panel. So, so far we have, we have saying regional organization, it could be part of the CMO, um, Barca, there's no app there. Um, we have the the IPPA, the Indo Pacific Prehistoric Association, we have Association of Asian Studies, uh, European Association of Southeast Asian Archaeology. So, all these conference organizations generally have panels related to either it's country based, Cambodia, Indonesia, for example, or it could be almost. It, Days, which could be a part of. 
So my experience that sometimes I, I speak a lot of the Cambodian studies, sometimes I would be part of uh, regional studies, East Asian studies, and sometimes I would be part of a political economy at the LT. And I I use that for opportunity as a set for these um, conference. I set a opportunity, right? So I have a purpose writing can be a bit broad. Then comes down to our topic of topic. So the existing journal so far in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Can, can we finish okay. on this slide because we're running over time now? So could you finish on this oh, slide? Thank you. Yes. So this has been a conference, uh, the publication event that we explore. And Last thing I want to say is this language of um, interaction, neural function. So in the past, we used Sanskrit, Pali, um, um, the uh, alphabet derived from Southern Burmese as, as means of interactions. Now the meaning of interaction, neural function in English. So our complication to my objects should be in this mediums to address but then what helps so for us I think it's not perfect I, I still need my friends my colleagues and collaborators to help me through the and help me through the submission process so that has been the case if you have um for the finding public these are the steps to do so finding uh clue readers Target the specific journal for them. So, the recap is I've talked about academic books. I talked about um, writing for largest regional themes. I talked about lingual hunter, when uh, used for publication. Sorry, I I got over time. I hope this helps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, we'll move right on to uh, Seal Tukivit, who is the director of the Department of Planning and Statistics at the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts in Cambodia and a lecturer at the Royal University of Fine Arts uh, in Phnom Penh at the Department of Archaeology. Um, also graduated from there along with Pifal, and um, has very, very recently submitted a final draft of his PhD. <laughs> Decon decolonizing my PhD. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Professor Thompson, and also the organizing team committees for uh, having me to, to speak here as the to, show, to share my experience of uh, publishing uh, in Cambodia in, gen in general. And this, is, this uh, 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 presentation is not an exhaustive uh, survey about the publication on art and archaeology in Cambodia, but it's just uh, to give you an example of, of you know, what it as a way forward so that you can understand it, you know, like uh, what are the issues, what are the problems. So I, I listened to the previous speakers and then I learned something that I also experienced in Cambodia. It is the problem of translation. I think it should be addressed in a very serious way. Otherwise, you know, the translation cannot be used. And I, I think that is very, um, I, I also, you know, like, um, would like to, you know, discuss with all of that um, in, in our uh, discussion today. So. Uh, I, I will, uh, the, the publishing initiatives in, for arts and archaeology, it started, you know, like uh, roughly after the, uh, in 2000, something like that. Uh, there, there are certain uh, institutions, uh, 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 public institutions, for example, uh, starting in, uh, in the late 1990s uh, by the Aptara Authority. It is an authority that is managed uh, the Angkor areas, and the, the publication is called Udaya. 
the, the rising sun. Uh, the Udayas is the first aim, as I learned from the, the co-author, which is the Professor Thompson and also Professor Ang Chulian, in, uh, uh, that the idea, the, the initiative ideas was to encourage the publication in Khmer language, you know, like much more than um, uh, French and English. It's not, it doesn't mean that, you know, like French and English is a, a competition or something, but it just for uh, encouraging the reading, you know, providing more uh, materials for the local uh, rising experts or rising uh, researchers to learn more about their foreign countries. So that, those are the basic ideas in, in establishing, but, uh, you know, like it, it's not uh, reached that level because of uh, certain difficulties in uh, uh, development of human resources in Cambodia. So, and, uh, and also, the, uh, there are NGOs that involve in that. For example, um, uh, CKS, one of the one of the examples. CKS is starting, you know, like uh, providing the platform for. Uh, uh, CKS is an international uh, organization working in Cambodia. You know, involved with the engaging the. Um, um, Krishna is here. Can help me in correcting if I'm, I'm wrong. She was the the former director, uh, executive director of the uh, CKS in Cambodia, and then th those are trying to bridge the world between, you know, like. Uh, uh, the French language, the English world, uh, francophone, um, um, anglophones, and, and Khmer, you know, all together like that. So those are the, the certain initiatives. I will show you an, an examples here. And they're also one of the, the most important one, I think, among all, is the Rayum, um, uh, Rayum Institution. It's now it's not, uh, it's not function as it, it was. It was very, very active in, 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 in early t uh, 2000s, and then um, it, it's not active anymore. I don't know how to press this. <coughs> okay. So this is uh, the example. I, I said the rise and the fall of public is publishing house. You know, like for example, Rayum as the, uh, I give you the, the example. Rayum is some of the organization that uh, the, the, the local NGO created, co-funded by Ingrid Moansi, uh, the late Ingrid Moan, and uh, Lida Rabot, and, and both of them are trying to make publication and also engaging the younger uh, graduated from the Department of Archaeology in Cambodia so that they can, you know, be able to do research and hoping sometime like building the, uh, the younger research in Cambodia. So you see that uh, some of the publications here, um, I don't know, here it's like, um, this is the Rayum, and these are Rayum, and these are Rayum, you know, like they, they try to engage all the, uh, providing uh, the sources, and then those publications are, um, um, uh, in Khmer, in, uh, in, in, some, um, in, 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 in English, I think, as well. And there are also some other uh, publications, for example, uh, the, the Department of Archaeology. I myself also involved in that uh, creation of journals, but it, it won't sustain, you know, like it depends, it requires a lot of times, it requires human resources. You know, if you're not really in, in it, and then it, it, it died. Like this one, it created and then we have sustained it for three years and then it's gone. You know, like three issues and then it's gone. And uh, there, there are many, many other uh, issues like that. And the, um, um, there are some sustaining um, publications that is still, uh, for example, that is the um, uh, Udaya, that now it's it, it coming to the, um, uh, an NGO, the local NGO that is providing the publications on uh, one of the, um, uh, it's called Yu Sao Tho, and then um, uh, the, the, the journal that published by the, the Yu Sao Tho is Udaya, and as well as the local language is called Khmer Renaissance here. And these are the, the publication I just show you that, uh, you know, encouraging, this is the, the publication calling the souls, and then the learning. there are many materials that published at that time. It was very useful for the students as well. And this is uh, just an example. And these are when this one died, unfortunately, this one died, and arising this one, which is the same from the same university, and then it just one issue and died again. <laughs> this, is the, this is the really issue of, uh, you know, how can you sustain, you know, like, uh, how can you sustain the um, the publications in, in art and archaeology and also others, you know, like it's very similar. Art and archaeology is just an example of the publication in Cambodia in general. I will, I will, I will show you that and then I hope in, in, in order to discuss and engage and learn and then we try to deal with how, how can we sustain that kind of work. 
Um, here is the, 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 the organization, the NGOs that I mentioned, it's called Youth South Hill. you can access it. There are articles uh, that you can access online, it's open-ended, you know, like you can access and download those articles from Udaya. And this is a... And what I can see, Udaya, I, I, I see Udaya is one of the platforms that I can see here. The easiest the platforms that engage the local, the local researchers and into from from the local into the international level, you know, like from uh, very simple. Uh, the, uh, it is starting from the Khmer Renaissance. Khmer Renaissance is uh, one of the local language. It, 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 it published in Khmer, based on one of the basic simple ideas. What do you think about that? So people can start writing, you know, learn how to write by by providing examples of you know like simple thing. Make that is the idea. One of the ideas is that to make people think and then step forward. But at the same time, from, from uh, one of these, the, the, the Khmer Renaissance, you know, articles, students from the Department of Archaeology can pick up from themes, you know, because it's very condensed. It, it, two pages in Khmer, you know, and then, but it, it's very condensed. They can develop it into the uh, thesis and, and uh, you know, some other references. And now it's very well organized. In France, they use the, those articles for uh, lecture, for teaching. Pan me, because I might go off. Um, and <laughs> so um, that the, the, this matter the song, the article, for example, I show you here. It is it is the newly published about the art about uh, Mr. Um Sori he published and you know like the, the market depicted from the one of the bar reliefs at the, in Hong Kong. And here is the comparative. This is very very important. You know you can see the continuities of a, a lady wearing the flowers in the. Uh, Hey, yes, and then it's continued from the past. So this is a kind of you know approach, new approach, tested on that very simple platform, two pages with images. Uh, many images is you know like make it, make people uh, learn uh, from that. And this is another example that uh, I say it is a, a bridge, a, a platform from a very simple one into a very developed one. So this is about the, the discovery of one of the kin sites in, uh, in nearby Angkor. It, 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 the author claimed that, claimed that to be the, the, the big one in Southeast Asia it, by Mr. Ian Ar. And he's, he is um, later on published in Udaya, you know, like in a step, you know, like you can develop your article from here and then you can move forward. And he publishes the, exactly the same, I mean, like the one is condensed in Khmer and a, a little bit more elaborated in, in Udaya here. But like uh, uh, Noel just mentioned, you know, publish or die, you know, like that is, the, it is it, uh, it, uh, publish or pu perish, perish, right? And then this is the, you know, he published in, 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 uh, in English so that he can, you know, gain more audience and stuff like that. I think those kind of, the question that should be addressed should be, we all together should learn how to integrate the, the local people, you know, like how to bridge from the, the, uh, the international a research uh, academy or, or the communities and then the local, how can we, we improve that? I will go. These are Udaya. The Udaya is the, the example. These are the last issues of that. And this is the, you know, like there are many, many, many useful articles that you can download. And, uh, and also the Khmer Renaissance, I, I just said, and Professor Thompson just mentioned about, I just submitting or sending my, my draft to my uh, professor at Berkeley. And this is, uh, you know, like in Khmer Renaissance, I also have referred to that because it's very useful. It, it is, you know, like there are a lot of information in that you can refer to because some people, they even those very, very simple questions, but they really address the, the, the issues concerned. Mm -hmm. So these are the publications. This is to show you the, uh, the CKS, the Center for Khmer Studies, uh, the international uh, uh, NGO uh, in Cambodia. So their publication is very useful too. You know, like the publication, the availability of the publication is, it means that encourage the, the people to come and, and do the, you know, writing and articles and stuff like that. But there are challenges. This is an example of another private enterprise to publish, but it published in Khmer. I say this, it, it, the, the, availability, the availabilities of the articles and stuff in Khmer. And there are problems. There are problems in that. You know, in Khmer Renaissance, I am involved with, the, with Udaya. We don't have articles. People don't submit it. Because what is the point of submitting it? You know, what I, I use credit for what? You know, going to the university or... That is, that is the big problems in there. They publish it. They publish it in uh, 
uh, Khmer uh, in, uh, on, on Facebook, you know? Rather than write it a short article or something that people can refer to, they publish it on Facebook. And I find it very astonishing. For example, this one, it's very important. You, I have never seen this one. This is, for me, it's Lakshmi. You know, like, it's very important. You know, like, uh, no one really, you know, uh, uh, further research, but rather than writing, many people, they, they uh, you know, like, uh, the, the spectacular discoveries of something, put it on Facebook, and then it trumps the moral values of the research. You know, that is, the, that is the, one of the big problems here. And, and what about that? There, there, there are many challenges that discouraging researchers in Cambodians right now that there are some expressions, they say Sanyapat and Sanyakhoi. Sanyapat is for degrees. And then the, the other Sanyakhoi is like, you see, it means like uh, the practical knowledge that you can realize it. But that expression is downplay the real researchers. You know, like you go to the degree, oh, I know that you come back and you cannot do something. That is some notion deriving after the Khmer rules, you know, like uh, uh, showing that. But now some people really try to get, oh, I get my PhD from here and there, you know. Um, and also the, the, the older generation and younger generation, you know, like, oh, I am the older, so I know everything. You cannot, I, you, don't challenge me. Some of the speakers just mentioned about that kind of stuff, you know, like, don't challenge me. I challenge them sometimes. So, but if you don't challenge them, you know, they, they will be, sorry? You're old. <laughs> My older generation, I'm sorry. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and there, there are, the, there, there are uh, you know, like some of the authors, uh, they, you know, like, especially they are the, the practitioners, really uh, quick. They, they refer to the text as the authority, you know, like, that is my authority, you know, like, when I publish it, no one, no peer review, nothing, you know, like, uh, it, it is at the end of the world. It's like the, the Buddhist canonical, um, what is it? Um, uh, uh, Yes, yeah, like a Chattaka or Trimaytak, Tripitaka. So it's like that. And that, that is the, you know, like a lack of interest discouraging them. You know, self-publication is many, many, many publications, but when you are really approached in a scientific way, you cannot use it. But you can use them as the, some certain information that can glimpse out of it, but not, uh, you know, like really uh, a, a, a reference. It's a big problem. Lack of editorial system, Peer reviews, all of us, we have the same problems in, I think, a very, very similar problem in Southeast Asia. Copyright, you, you, uh, in Thailand, is much better in, than in Cambodia, I agree. And I agree with Krishna, too, you know, like that is the, some of the possibilities. We cannot afford to buy $20 books, you know. Our salary is $20, too, back then, but now it's getting better. <laughs> and plagiarism is a problem, you know, like uh, we copy and copy. Sometimes we say, I copy from here and I copy from there, and then they say, oh, okay. That's mine, you know, like, it, it, uh, copy until it become mine, so. Uh, so this is all, all of this is to say, you know, the, it is the way looking forward. What can we do to enable that kind of stuff? And I am open to discuss that, and I think everyone will engage in that, and then we go further together, and then helping the local, uh, you know, researchers, young researchers to move forward, you know, like, and engaging and decolonizing the, you know, um, research and stuff like that. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'll work out of time again. Some, sometimes we don't recognize that we have become the older generation, but that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, so our next speaker is Seng who is uh, who is the Dean of the Department of Archaeology that we have all been referring to. Uh, she's taking a break from that work at the moment to do an MA here at SOAS. And uh, she will be talking to us. Uh, she's also a very accomplished uh, researcher with a, a background, particularly in, uh, in recent uh, archaeological work um, on prehistory in Cambodia, and the co author of um, some important work, um, a book, and some important articles in that field. So I will hand it over to uh, Nitra. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, people. <laughs> uh, thank you, Nekru, and the organizing committee for inviting me to give a uh, talk here, even if I don't feel comfortable, but I will do it. Today I'm going to... 
Today I'm going to talk about uh, the current situation of the uh, Department of Archaeology and some uh, issue concerning education and publication at the Royal University of Fine Arts. First of all, I will briefly talk about the curriculum at the Department of Archaeology and then followed by the problems with teachers and teachings and also with the students. And then uh, I will highlight about the current situation of the library uh, at, the, at the university. And lastly, will be a, a short description about the activity of the Rufa Research Center and uh, con I will conclude with a uh, short conclusion at the end. The, the Royal University of Fine Art consists of uh, five departments, uh, namely Department of Archaeology, Department of Architecture and Urbanism, Department, department of Plastic Arts, and uh, Department of Choreography, and lastly the Department of Music, and we, have, we also have a research center. But uh, today I will focus mainly on the Department of Archaeology and the Research Center, uh, how we uh, work uh, with the student and the publication. Uh, the Department of Archaeology, uh, the, the mission of the department is mainly uh, to teach the classical uh, art, my art and archaeology. The, the curriculum of its undergraduate program consists of uh, one foundation year plus uh, three regular year. And the main subject, main teaching subject is art, my archaeology, art history, my epigraphy, historical ethnography, mm -hmm. uh, Indian art history, Southeast Asian art history, linguistic and prehistory. Uh, no option available, unfortunately, so then have to take all the subjects we have. So there is no option. And uh, finally, and, and in final year, students have to write a uh, dissertation. Uh, we, for, for the last five years, we have a special French MA <coughs> program uh, in cooperation with Inalco France. And uh, it will be finishing this year, and hopefully, we will uh, continue for uh, the more in the following year. Uh, we have a lot of uh, problems concerning teachers and teaching in, at, the, at the Department of Archaeology uh, nowadays as uh, most, of the, most of our teachers are not permanent teachers at the, at the department. They have their full-time job somewhere else like the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts or at the Absara Authority or at the National Museum and Sometimes we have to uh, encourage our admin staff to teach as well. So they have to work as admin staff and also they have to teach. Uh, yeah. So uh, as we have, uh, we do not, we, uh, sorry. As uh, we are in short of teaching staff, so uh, quali teacher's qualification uh, requirement is difficult to apply. So we just uh, accept those who have time, enough time to teach. So we, 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 cannot, uh, uh, we cannot limit that the, the teacher have to, to have a PhD or have to have higher qualification. So this is the uh, difficult point for, for us. And so from this, it is hard to get the, to get a teaching syllabus uh, from the student as uh, most of, of the teacher do not provide their syllabus or haven't updated them as they do not have enough time to do their research or to work uh, for the university as they have to uh, fulfill their, uh, their duty at their own uh, institution. Sometimes teachers provide the syllabus, but 
sometimes in the class they do not have uh, they do not even have a reading list for the students so it is hard for students to enlarge or to uh, to get more knowledge from reading outside or sometimes they do provide the reading list but the publication is not available in the library so it's also another difficult point yeah and we, we still have uh, uh, the, as the assessment style uh, mainly based on exam and most of the exam are, are based on uh, class lecture only. So there, there is no uh, kind, some kind of uh, like essays or uh, research uh, paper that students have to go to make their independent research in the library and so on. So. And then during their final year dissertation, it is a kind of like their first time reading and doing research, uh, independent research. So it is difficult for them to start uh, at this time. Now uh, let's move on to the students, problem with students. Uh, only Foreign language is still a major concern for our students. I think in other Southeast Asian countries too, but mainly in Cambodia, uh, it is not our uh, first language, so it is still very difficult. And only few students can read or write French or English, uh, despite the limited av availability of publication in English and French in the library. So. It is a, a kind of barrier for them to get uh, like updated uh, knowledge about recent publication from uh, local and international researchers. What is also uh, a point of concern about is that is their ability to conduct independent research or to produce any scientific analytical research as. As they, were, as they were not trained to do so since they were young and access to research environment is also very limited. And the last point is that they are in the interaction between teachers and students outside of the classroom is very limited as well because the uh, teacher do not have enough time outside of the classroom. Now let's move to the library. We do have a small library in our university list and uh, since, since one year the, the situation of the library is improved as uh, we extend the the opening hours of the library from seven hours to nine and a half. <laughs> it means uh, open from 7.30 until five in the evening without lunch break and from Monday to Friday. So unfortunately, we do not have uh, internet when with very limited internet access. Uh, we still have a uh, very few publication. Uh, uh, if comparing to SOAS, I think we have uh, the publication of uh, about Cambodian uh, archaeology or art history. I think less than uh, one tenth or so. Yeah. So it, it is very uh, unfortunate. So the, the, the publication is problem and we do not have the online catalog or database. We still use very old system uh, in the library. So we uh, students have to search the book uh, in the cupboard or in the, the catalog uh, in the books. And then uh, some of the book, most of the book, uh, we do not have uh, duplicated uh, book so that the student can borrow and read outside of the library so they have to be uh, in the library during the reading. And the last 
the last one is uh, that we only two staff working in the library. They, so mainly they 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 barely had uh, enough time to do anything else besides uh, keeping record of the borrower and uh, so the maintenance of the book and making any updates of the system in the library is also uh, very difficult. The, the research center uh, of the university uh, is starting to have some more activities since uh, we have uh, our uh, freshly graduate uh, from SOAS, Mr. Girota, who graduated in 2018, and he is now the head of the research center. Uh, and the mission of the research center is to conduct research related to the department interest, uh, five department interests uh, in yeah uh, we, we, we also the the the, the the mission of the center is also to initiate the publishing research. Uh, we, we try to uh, to publish the bulletin of the Royal University of Fine Art, which uh, mainly uh, uh, encourage students, staff, and the teachers of the university to publish their research, and so on and. This uh, the the first the first bulletin of the University of Fine Art just uh, printed out yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I just got the information from Rata, uh, fortunately, and then uh, I, I hope it will not die after <laughs> one issue, <laughs> as we have said. <laughs> we, we will we will do our best to have more issue in the future and every year. I hope, yeah. This is the uh, uh, the first bulletin that I just got uh, the photo from Rata yesterday. Yeah, and finally to conclude, uh, to sum up the the for the last thirty years since its reopening after the Khmer Rouge. Some 700 uh, students have graduated from the Department of Archaeology. Among those, some have worked in the field, like, uh, in the field including archaeology, art history, conservation, and so forth. However, concerning our, our, uh, our, our present situation, uh, national and international we need both national and international support in order to strengthen the quality of education in the Department of Archaeology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nitra. Um, so we have a, another mover and shaper with us today. Uh, we're very, very happy to be able to welcome Krishna Uk, who is the senior advisor to the board of directors in charge of development, outreach, and strategic initiatives uh, for the Association for Asian Studies. Prior to joining AAS, uh, as you have already heard this morning, uh, Krishna, or this afternoon, Krishna was the executive director of the Center for Khmer Studies uh, based in Siem Reap in northern Cambodia. She received her PhD in social anthropology from Cambridge University. Uh, for which she worked on the Jirai ethnic minority um, and produced a monograph as a result of that. The monograph is entitled Salvage Cultural Resilience Among the Jirai of Northeast Cambodia. So please join me in welcoming the Krishna. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley, for inviting me. Um, my presentation is really about what we're trying to do today at the Association for Asian Studies, and especially me in my role in creating new initiatives that are connected with Southeast Asia as a region, but also 
uh, connected with underrepresented fields of Asian studies, including archaeology, art history, and, uh, and architecture. So we're really going to focus on the recent international research development uh, project. Just to give you an overview, this is um, uh, a, a sort of rough picture of how many members we have today, a bit more than 6,200. And the demography here shows that most of the people who are members of AIS are essentially historian um, or anthropologist, people specialized in literature, religion studies. Uh, Asian studies here, um, this column here is, is sort of very sort of broad. Um, but here I sort of highlighted the ones who are working in art and art history and over there uh, archaeology. So as you can see, um, they are present, um, but they're quite uh, underrepresented within the, uh, the wider demography of our, of our membership. Uh, to give you another snapshot of how it looks like, this is, um, this is the Denver annual conference that we had last March, and it will show you uh, the type of um, uh, people who participated in the conference. So mostly art and art historian here highlighted in yellow uh, only represent about, sorry, it, it, I think that things have moved a bit, they've shifted a bit. But uh, it shows that about 158 people um, uh, from that field actually registered and, um, yeah, and it's representing 5.4% of the 3,200 members who participate in the conference. And then if you look at the registration by region here, it shows that for Denver here, you had 411 people, so 14%, which is um, uh, slightly less than what we had in uh, Washington DC last year in 2018, where 13% of the panelists and participants coming from Southeast Asia. As you can see, most of our annual conference really gather people from China and Inner Asia, but also Northeast Asia. The regions of Asia that are often uh, and consistently underrepresented are Southeast Asia and South Asia. So, um, starting with this um, uh, um, sort of um, acknowledgement, I sort of launched different initiative in order to bring together these underrepresented fields of studies with the underrepresented region. So I started um, a special panel within the AS uh, that was gathering um, uh, Asian artists from different parts of Asia. And um, the artist demography also is really quite small. We don't have that many artists who can share their knowledge and experience. Most of the people coming are, are scholars, as you know, and students. So this was an interesting way to uh, sort of uh, start a conversation with people with different types of skills and different types of knowledge. So I invited two artists from uh, Cambodia and Myanmar. This was in Washington DC last year. Some of you know uh, Saret Svai, who is um, an artist based in Siem Reap. He used to be the artistic director of um, Artisan d'Encore. He's no more with them now. But he does some absolutely spectacular work using uh, kapok, which is some form of cotton and sculpture. This is the Vesanta Rajtaka, which, is now, uh, which was presented at the Biennale in, um, in Australia. And uh, the other person that I invited from uh, Myanmar is Min Zayao. You probably recognize this picture. It's very well known. He took this picture of Aung San Suu Kyi just after the sort of landslide victory of her party uh, in, the latest, uh, in the latest election. So the idea was to bring together these two artists to talk about Asian arts and resistant defined subject and their disobedient objects. This was funded by the Ford Foundation. And without focusing too much on Southeast Asia, the idea was to put them in conversation with other artists from other regions. And the other artists were Samsung Wong from Hong Kong, who is a visual artist. He's quite famous for creating this, um, uh, this visual installation which shows a countdown. Here it says until 1st of July 2047, which is quite um, controversial, and was stopped 
um, because the Chinese, a Chinese delegation came at that moment. And then uh, two film directors, documentary director, uh, Savneko and Tusha Mada from India, who did a brilliant documentary about arts in Kashmir. So it's really looking into different aspects of arts today in this place which is heavily uh, occupied by the Indian military. Um, this was really quite successful. Uh, the problem, I think, was that we also wanted to have some exhibition, but we didn't really have the space. As you know, AS is really focused on panel, and the format is quite traditional, so it's essentially going to uh, schedule panel and have PowerPoint presentation. This, this was like an experiment, which we continued this year with another, um, uh, with another uh, uh, roundtable. So this is to put them together, it shows you uh, what Saret did for Washington DC. It's actually, a, it's actually a puppet of Donald Trump. This is Donald Trump. And the idea was to have him as a sort of um, uh, a figure of America first. And then we had a photo exhibition of Min Zayao, including pictures of the Rohingya that he followed all the way to Bangladesh and then got in prison for about two weeks. Um, this is also uh, another image of what Samson Wong did in, um, has done in, in Hong Kong. He participated by Skype, and this is just a, 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 a sort of screenshot of, of the documentary. Uh, the idea, again, was not just to isolate Southeast Asia, but to replace it into an Asian wider context, whereby Southeast Asia really appear relevant as, um, as a sort of artist and, and scholarship and, and art history. This year, we continued with the experiment, but this time we were better organized because we had local partners. So in addition to the roundtable that I organized, this time on arts and the military occupation, we pulled together, selected different artists from different regions, and I asked uh, my colleagues from the different council um, to uh, give some ideas. So for Cambodia, again, we had um, this time Sekhon Lien, who did uh, some actually spectacular painting. Uh, and he had his solo exhibition at the McNichol Center, Civic Center in Denver. This is Maria Madeira, who is from Timor-Leste. Uh, although Southeast Asia is an underrepresented region, within this underrepresented region, you also have underrepresented countries. And Timor-Leste is one of them. And we're really chuffed because she's, uh, she's an incredible woman artist. So in conversation with these two Southeast Asian artists, we had Rushan Elahi, who is um, from Kashmir. His nom de guerre is MC Cash, and he's a rapper. And we also had Tenzing Rigdal, who is quite well known in uh, Tibetan artwork. And all of his work here is related to uh, here um, monks' immolation and the, uh, and the concern about who will become the next Dalai Lama. So we had some really brilliant conversation this time with these artists and the structure in place to put together all these exhibitions, including a performance by um, uh, Rushan Elai, a hip-hop performance during the conference. So this, I think, has helped really raise the profile of uh, art history, but also artists within the field and, and within the framework of our annual conference. We're going to try to carry on. The first uh, initiative was funded by the Ford Foundation. This one was funded by the Asian Cultural Council in New York. And because it really exceeded their expectation, especially with all the different types of um, ancillary activities that we provided, we might be able to carry on in the next, uh, in the next few years. In addition to that, we also had a special panel this year in Denver. Uh, we're, to, to cut a long story short, um, we, we had this idea with Martin Polkinghorne, who is an archaeologist based in Cambodia, to focus on latest research uh, concentrated on the middle period, because there's very little known on that. And we had Kong Virat, for example, the director of the National Museum, to come and talk. But at the very last moment, everybody cancelled. So I called Miriam Stark at Hawaii. Uh, the only person who did not cancel was uh, Tom Chandler from Monash University because he was involved in another panel. I called Miriam and I said, we really need an archaeology panel because, again, it's underrepresented. And at the 11th hour, we put together this uh, panel focusing on, 
on Maritime Cambodia and Southeast Asia, and we're extremely grateful to PayPal who accepted to attend and, and be our main spokesperson and, and speaker uh, at the very last minute. It, um, Angelina actually can testify, she was there at the uh, round table. We basically had uh, Miriam as a chair and discussion, Tom who was uh, sort of uh, part of the also organizing team, and people are talking about beads in Southeast Asia. And what happened is that we completely changed the format and instead of having two people doing PowerPoint, we just threw a whole lot of conversation and questions to the audience. The idea was this is the state of the research in modern period. We have lots of gaps. Can people within the audience just fill in the gaps? And it was an incredible discussion, extremely uh, uh, diverse, very dynamic. The conversation, instead of the usual 15 minutes Q&A, was about 40 minutes. So we really had the time to exchange information. We had a historian, art historian, architect, archaeologist from Thailand, the Philippines, and different parts of Southeast Asia. And with these different types of format, I think we're going to try to do that again and maybe organize something for Boston in 2020, whereby we'll have, again, different people uh, who will be able to just basically brainstorm on what is being done and what are the main questions that people are trying to sort of find answers for. Um, the, uh, uh, there was also another panel that I helped put in place, which this time focused on architecture. Architecture, uh, also within art history, uh, is, is not well represented enough. So together with François Tinturier from the INIA Institute based in Yangon, we put together this uh, interesting panel that was talking about different sort of state building during the post-independence period in Southeast Asia and their social role. This is a, a picture for you, for those who know Phnom Penh, uh, of the white building uh, that was designed um, by... Uh, uh, and then here you have the Chunking Mansion in Hong Kong. So in these two examples from Cambodia, Vietnam, and Myanmar, we also had um, something on Hong Kong, which was great because, again, it brought together Southeast Asia in a sort of bigger sort of geographical plane, whereby we could also talk about uh, different places where occurrences, um, similar occurrences and comparative studies could be made. Um, in addition to these different panels, we also experimented this year in Denver with uh, a digital technologies exposition. The idea was that a lot of the scholars today are working using, using virtual re reality, and that's the case of Tom Chandler, but also different types of uh, technologies to do digitization and sometimes 3D um, printing. So Tom uh, was uh, one of the highlights of this program, which lasted a day and a half, and presented all his latest work on visualizing Angkor. Some of you know this work, and it's really quite spectacular. And the idea was to be able to uh, share with other colleagues who might be interested in furthering the research, their research, in using this type of data and connecting with, um, uh, with the people who are involved in furthering the technology, but also including within this technology the latest research finding. So I think that this is something that we will continue to do in Denver, uh, in, uh, in Boston after Denver, and we'll, um, we'll try to, uh, to bring together people who are from the art history field, but also archaeology. I think it's important that we try to sort of kill different birds with one stone, and this was one of the case. Um, next year, we're going to try to have maybe some uh, people who can talk about the Dan Huang case and the, uh, the incredible work that has been done in terms of digitization and how these digitized images can be uh, used by students and professors in, in the school. Um, to finish, this is what is in preparation for Boston next March. We're working again with the Asian Cultural Council in uh, maybe organizing another roundtable. The topic at the moment is about arts and politics because we feel that it's, it's a topic that there's a lot to say about, but it's also much more uh, sort of tr attractive in terms of funding and in terms of the people working on this issue today. Uh, we're also, uh, together with the INIA Institute in Yangon, trying to uh, bring together different uh, architects um, and art historians 
who can uh, present on Buddhist polities in, in the region. And again, we try to diversify the geography. One of the main, um, uh, you know, that you have to go through a, a sort of review process when you submit a proposal. And one of the things that the program committee is looking is really diversity. So how is your panel really going to advance the research in this particular field? The more diverse it is and the more cutting edge, the better you, chance you have to, you know, being accepted. Then together with the Harvard University and um, New York, um, New York Southeast Asian Network, we're trying to organize different types of exhibition and performances. We haven't done very much of that in the past uh, AAS annual conferences, but we're trying to maybe organize some performances from Southeast Asian artists who are not necessarily based in Southeast Asia, but we're thinking about the diaspora in the US and reaching out to this young generation who were born in the US and who are interested in bridging the gap between you know, their country of origin and, and who they are and where they are now. And again, the digital technologies exposition, as I said, I think will resume with, uh, with more interesting perspective on what is being done with um, different subject areas and geographical, geograph geographical parts of the world. Thank you. At uh, one point, when you say Facebook distraction, I sort of don't agree with you because, you know, I'm a Facebook user, but not very often. Yeah, I try to refrain. Yeah, and sometimes I, I, I deactivate my account just to f focus on my writing. But, you know, when I deactivate my account, I think like I don't connect with the world outside because I know today there are a lot of like side. Uh, surveys or like excavation somewhere in Vietnam and some of my friends when they are doing excavation they put something on Facebook uh, yeah so in that way I know what's going on there yes yeah, so I mean like I, I, I'm, I, I stay connected with Facebook but also I try to stay from a distance yeah but still connected yeah but I, 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 I don't think it's distraction but I think we should have the way to encourage people to write, yeah, to develop the, a habit of writing, the culture of writing, not just like a photo essay, but it's like analytical essay using the photos. Yeah, and I think Facebook is still a good channel to connect to the world. Totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> not a black and white issue certainly but I think I think a lot of what's coming out in the in the presentation so far thus far is also the question of of editorial perspective editorial work and a lot of it is you know it's 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 these are these are larger questions that you know it enters into the questions of fake news and how 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 Facebook how the internet is unmonitored is unregulated and I think when you when you drill down to let's say the you know the Cambodia archaeology level or the Vietnam archaeology level, how do you think about those questions, um, which are complicated ones? Opening out, enabling access, enabling exchange, enabling ena enabling knowledge, but also disabling uh, certain forms of quality control, shall we say, which are certain forms of quality control and certain forms of um, shall we say, uh, let's sort of segue into copyright, right? How do, how do we think about that and how do we manage that in a productive manner without opening up discourse, opening up exchange rather than closing it down? And it seems that it's not a straight, there's not a straightforward answer, but the, the question of editorial perspectives and editorial work 
is, is a very important one there, and I think an important one that you all are facing with Bratu as well. Um, where do you intervene and where do you not intervene, right? So, um, I, can I add? Yeah. I just add to her because um, they don't really deactivate. They just post and post and post and never have time to write an article or something. We, we ask for, I, I, I call directly to those people, you know, can you write a short article about your discovery and post it on Khmer uh, Songs or something? You know, we have certain uh, peer review or some kind of editing, you know, like, uh, uh, but they don't really do it. They say, oh, I cannot write. Oh, I cannot write. I'm sorry. And, I, and they don't really deactivate the account like you. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe I, maybe I can share an example. <laughs> For the news part of journal, yes, we had we had space for academic articles, but I wanted to leave space for uh, things like Facebook posts. Uh, so uh, what I call multimedia articles. So if you want to put a video, you can put a video. If you want to put a photo, you did. And uh, I don't know if it's here, but one of, one of I found somebody on Instagram who started posting uh, sketches of uh, Sarawak. Um, Culture. So she, she, she was an illustrator. She started drawing artifacts from the museum because she was working in the museum. And she had a series of uh, 30 days of volume or so. Every day she would draw a sketch of an, art, an artifact in the museum and then she would put it on in Instagram. And so I asked her, I, I love your work. Could, you, could, you, could, I, could I use your, your work and use it as a multimedia article? And that became our first multimedia article in, in this part of journal. Uh, and that's, that's one way I, I co-opted uh, online content like that into, into uh, the journal. I think we probably should uh, stop this panel now in order to move on to our to our last group. All right, so um, stretch your legs while we get ourselves set up. Thank you, Thank you very much. For all. You don't need to know who I am. Um, and we will start with uh, Christina, Christina Huang from SOAS, who teaches uh, Philippine studies. And, and that's, that's all I have to say. Christina, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so very briefly, um, Ashley invited me to come, um, come to talk about um, the Philippine studies projects here at SOAS. So um, I'm just going to give a brief overview of publishing trends in the Philippines and kind of try to understand um, so, sort of the historical kind of background and see how this can be sort of decolonized or how we are trying to decolonize that here at SOAS. So um, as we probably know, um, the Philippines is kind of a, um, it's kind of a, um, an adopted child, you might say, of Southeast Asia. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, in a way, we kind of have to decolonize Southeast Asian studies in relation to the Philippines, I guess. But, um, uh, but it's an interesting sort of halfway house because it's at the western edge of the Pacific, so it has relations to America, to the Americas. And then it's on the eastern edge of um, the imperial uh, empires of Europe. So you kind of have this, it, it's a, a kind of cross current in that sense. So, um, and also, uh, not to mention, of course, colonization from China, from the north. So um, um, because of this sort of, um, in some sense, uh, the Philippines has been sort of colonized uh, many times over. So, um, if, so if you look at the roots of uh, publishing uh, in the Philippines, it go, uh, much of it goes deep into the history of colonization. Yeah? So book publishing as an industry goes way back in the Philippines as early as 1593. Um, with the first woodblock printed uh, uh, books in Manila, uh, uh, published by the Dominican friars at the University of Santo Tomas. Um, interestingly, the these are religious books, and um, uh, these were produced mostly for foreigners. So the market, in the, even then, uh, was a very foreign-based sort of market. Uh, this, the Doctrina Christiana, uh, was published for friars in order to catechize the the, the, the natives, you might say. And the interesting one here, actually, is this is a, a, a Chinese book 
uh, that was supposed to be used uh, for conversion, as Manila was used as a base for conversion, um, uh, the uh, uh, conversion missions uh, to China, uh, Manila being sort of a transshipment base. Um, um, I, I just wanted to show this to you. This is um, very recently Taiwanese scholars found this the world's largest and oldest extant uh, Chinese uh, Spanish dictionary in the USD archives. And um, in the same university press that was publishing the Digitrina Christiana. Um, so they are looking into this, trying to digitize it, and trying to see um, it is by far the sort of the largest um, extant one. Um, Going on, it, uh, sorry, kind of in a rush. Um, <laughs> um, fast forward to the 19th century, so we know the Spanish colonization, um, uh, the 19th century, and the coming of the Americans. And there we begin to see the kind of, uh, kind of the sort of uh, difference that we, we have in Philippine culture. Um, uh, with the Americans, there's the introduction of an American public school education. And there's a state uh, at the very beginning of bilingual uh, publications, Spanish and English at the beginning. Um, and these were mostly newspapers and, um, and, and different, um, uh, like short stories. Um, towards the, in, in 1908, the Philippine Assembly, under the American colonial administration, um, enacted um, uh, an uh, act uh, 1870, which was supposed to establish the University of the Philippines, and this is sort of significant in the public publishing uh, sort of history of the Philippines, as this has uh, become the biggest sort of publication um, source for academic journals and different things. Um, the existing in the Philippines, um, there were of course other university presses, uh, the Ateneo and of course La Salle and different and, and the Santo Tomas which continues to publish and is said to be the oldest or second to the oldest publishing uh, university house uh, university press. Now um, as we go on from Spanish colonization to American we go to um, Spanish bilingualism uh, it tapers down um, uh, towards the Philippine Commonwealth and then with, of course with the Philippine independence in, uh, from America in 1945. Uh, so it's not surprising to see that 89% um, of book publications from the American public school system as well as the market uh, now, 89% of book publications would be um, all in English. Um, there is of course um, some laws that make Tagalog as um, the national language, but the market um, is not as big, of course, as the English. Um, literacy levels in the Philippines continue to be high. Um, it's seven, at 76 percent. And um, here is um, an interesting development in the Philippines with uh, the establishment of the National Book Development uh, Board, which is actually really um, uh, very active in terms of promoting the publishing industry. Um, in the Philippines, they come up with a lot of these readership surveys and, um, and a lot of um, initiatives actually like um, um, uh, book prizes, um, they also have um, like uh, workshops and different things um, and, and that is their sort of um, um, mission. Anyway, um, the, the linguistic dominance of English in publishing, uh, however, um, in 2010 starting, uh, got kind of a, a bit of a, a dent in a sense when the Board of Education uh, established this law that said that, uh, the, which was the K-12 curriculum. And what they wanted to do was to mandate the teaching of, um, from grades one to three, the teaching of the mother tongue. And as you know, in the Philippines, there's like 300 different regional languages. So um, in that sense, um, this sort of uh, encouraged the publication of a lot of um, children's books in different regional languages, all of course funded by the national, uh, by, by the MBTB and the CHED. So this is kind of an interesting sort of, um, sort of brass route, but funded by the government, but in a sense, they're hiring like um, the people from each of the regions, uh, but and starting at a very simple level in that sense, but these are children's books. So these are from grades one to three. Um, um, and, uh, from the, same, uh, from the same development board, uh, these are just some of the things that 
they have been using and trying to sort of maybe decolonize these ideas of, uh, of publication. So one is they encourage the use of indigenous art terms, for example. So there is a call for, set, uh, still in English probably, the publication, but they want uh, people to focus on um, yeah, indigenous art terms. And what they do is publish a lot of dictionaries and a lot of workshops trying to unpack all these um, indigenous terms. Another thing uh, they do is to establish, um, sort of, to codify what they call Philippine English and sort of, so, sort of legitimize it in some sense. Uh, try, uh, so, the, uh, as we know, there's a lot of, um, tr uh, there's trending, um, looks into world Englishes, they might say, so that um, you, you kind of look at the language and, and localize it. And not only in terms of vocabulary, but like syntax switching as well. And of course, a third thing they, they, they offer a lot of is translation workshops and translation studies. Um, so um, they not only translate um, works from, from like Philippine works into English, but vice versa. So they do a lot of classics transferred into uh, Philippine regional languages. Um, and interestingly, in 2018, another law, uh, this time from the, Phil the Congress, was um, they established the by Bayin, which is the Philippine script. And there was a law passed in 2018 that mandated the use of Bay Bayin as a national writing system. So this is very significant in a way, well, since, well, since 1523, we've not had a, an indigenous script, and that has always been sort of a, a, a sort of, many have said, oh, we're, we're, because of the Latinization of the, of the alphabet, um, we're very colonized, so they are trying to address this. now. Um, it's, it's weird because um, a lot of these, um, it's a very sort of superficial, so they want manufacturers to um, put the labels of their products, for example, in Bai Bayin and then translate to English. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, anyway, we'll see what happens. It's, it's, this was just established in 2018. Anyway, now in the area of art and archaeology, uh, there are four major drivers uh, uh, for publishing. Um, sorry. Um, so these are the four that are, are kind of commonly seen as the sources for publications. So again, government-sponsored publications, the, the National Board, uh, the Book Board, and then um, there is also the CCP, this, uh, the Cultural Center of the Philippines. It publishes a lot of encyclopedias. This is the new one that came out recently, a 10-volume uh, compendium of art, art techniques, etc., and of course using sort of indigenous terms and trying to delve into those. And then of course there's also the National Culture, uh, sorry, the National uh, Commission for Culture and the Arts. So those are the two big governing bodies for, for arts and the culture. So the NCCA and the CCP. Now uh, more on the private side, there is the, um, the private museums that are very well funded, Ayala Museum for example, and the Yuchenko Museum. They do a lot of art shows and then they, they come out with, with with academic, uh, they, they give it to the university presses for publication, for example, so they come out with not just catalogs of art shows, but they, they have like essays, and review peer review essays in these books. One example is the one of the biggest shows that Ayala did was the gold exhibit that was in the Philippines, a permanent exhibit, and it was brought to New York, and now we have these publications coming out of those. The third one is more, um, more uh, commerce driven in a sense, and the Leon Gallery, for example, the, there's a sort of huge um, uh, surge in publication uh, in relation to auctions. Um, um, the Leon Gallery, for example, is um, sort of, it's the, it's the uh, second biggest driver of the Philippine economy in terms of creative industries and the arts, and they are publishing a lot of these, um, um, again, sort of academic, quasi-academic, but still um, kind of uh, substantial books on not only contemporary, Philippine contemporary art, but also um, like historical pieces. They, recently they, they discovered a Juan Luna painting and they, and they, they in, the, in, in Spain, but it was kind of the, the sketch for it and they did a huge study of whether it was fake or not. Of course, if, in the end, it was supposed to be auctioned off and then all of the research was surrounding that, but anyway. And then, of course, lastly, the university presses, which I've already mentioned. Now, um, now, in, um, <clears throat> now, given all of this, however, um, 
we know that the Philippines, the, the, this is just a, one of the surveys from the National Book Board. Um, the Philippines, the median uh, price that uh, anyone can afford in the Philippines for, for book buying is very little. But a lot, there is a lot of internet connection, Wi-Fi, or wireless connection. And um, while uh, the, the trend is still for books, uh, uh, for actual books, there is a definite um, sort of um, uh, working towards uh, the digital. So um, the CCP or the NCCA, for example, the CCP, aside from all their other paper publications, have. Uh, you can see a clear trend towards the digital. Uh, they do a lot of television shows. Dayao is uh, one of the native terms for art, for example, and they have this, um, yeah, documentaries on these arts. And you can actually watch them, and they, they come out in DVDs, and they distribute them um, uh, in libraries, for example. Um, coming to SOAS, which I really, was what I really wanted to do, was um, um, uh, we looked at all these sort of the, all these sort of barriers to access to print and publication, and we tried to figure out what can we do to sort of, in a way, um, use the, 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 the Philippine Studies program here at SOAS to address those issues. So there were three things that we did. Uh, one is the, we digitized a lot of the materials at the SOAS archives, uh, Philippine archives at SOAS, um, and uh, statistically, actually, the, the, the biggest drivers of, of the views for this are, are based in the Philippines. So it's actually, you can see in the Google stats that, um, and it is the second highest use of SOAS. Uh, a lot of downloads have come, and it is, um, um, with the grant money, uh, you can download and you can, um, but these are, of course, all acts free access, but these are all copyright free, so there's no issue. So um, there is a lot of that if you're interested, and we are actually open to, there's an open call to like, see if there are materials that are at SOAS that we can, uh, that the researchers are interested in that we can digitize. We are also currently working with um, the Spanish archives in, in trying to digitize or to link up with the Indios and Pipos in Sevilla, um, because all of their stuff is digitized, but there is, it's, uh, their, their interface is very, it's very hard to, to navigate. The Indios. Um, so the second thing that we did, we're doing is this geography of Philippine objects, which is a visual sort of mapping of different objects uh, that have been uh, that are in, in the UK. Um, so um, uh, so we are still working on it, uh, but uh, again, this is a um, an inventory, you might say, of objects in the UK of Philippine material culture up to the 19th century. And um, what we're trying to do is uh, outsour uh, crowdsource it. Um, we, we are looking at um, um, uh, houses, um, uh, national trust houses, and different things. And it, the, it, the back end is open. So you can email um, if you find something. Of course, we're linking with uh, the museums as well in terms of, of just inventorying um, everything. Sorry, I'm rushing through. <laughs> anyway, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, slight schedule change. Um, our second speaker is Ivy Tan, who is a PhD uh, student here at SOAS. Well, not much will do. Oh, so. Thank you. Hi, is this working? Hi, can you hear me yeah. at the back? Okay, great. Um, it's. Uh, yeah, I think I can multitask, that's fine. Um, so it's wonderful to be here and uh, view uh, Hong Kong within the wider context of uh, Southeast Asia, which is something that I believe should really be done more often. Um, and I'm going to address a bit more of that later on. Um, so I'm from Hong Kong, born and raised in Hong Kong, and I actually consider myself, uh, when you ask the question, like, who who considers English as the first language. I, I wasn't really sure there because I kind of consider myself bilingual and I think I speak for a lot of Hong Kong people who um, were basically taught their ABCs from day one um, and identify with an English name on their passport. Um, so I am very sick of people coming up to me saying, that doesn't sound like a Chinese name, tell me your real name. And that is very much part of the fabric of 
um, Hong Kong society and culture that people don't really understand. Um, so my title, um, A Borrowed City, Borrowed Art, um, actually comes from a classic text on Hong Kong history. Um, so this comes from um, uh, an author, Richard Hughes, who lived in Hong Kong for a long time, but very much comes from a very sort of a colonial British perspective uh, when he wrote his book on Hong Kong. Um, uh, and he said that it's a borrowed place, living on borrowed time. Hong Kong is an impotent capitalist survival on China's communist derriere. So it, it goes on. Um, and he actually borrowed this phrase himself from um, Han Su Yin, who was a uh, uh, quite a well-known uh, Eurasian author, and there have been Hollywood movies um, based on her, uh, her work. Um, and she borrowed that term from a Shanghai businessman who moved to Hong Kong, and his name was Tom Wu. Now, these are the sort of perspectives that you get from a... This is a book written in the 60s. So um, if you think about the wave of Shanghai immigrants going to Hong Kong, um, sort of 1949 period um, up to the 60s, Hong Kong was sort of seen as a voiceless community. It was a borrowed place on borrowed time. Um, and this is where the British colonialists were and where people um, saw uh, a place of, of refuge for political reasons, for um, you know, cultural revolution. Um, so that was all, all the context that was happening. And now, obviously, Hong Kong's not on borrowed time anymore. It's been returned to China, uh, you know, as a special administrative region. Uh, and this view on Hong Kong history obviously is extremely outdated. Um, and Richard Hughes, actually, in his book, said that um, there's no demand for democracy in Hong Kong. There's no... Uh, people are very pragmatic. They put their heads down. They just get on with it. Um, and obviously, that is very not extremely untrue, considering what's been happening recently with, you know, the umbrella movement and everything. Um, and so, I, I don't actually feel like uh, when we talk about decolonizing, I don't feel like there is actually one single voice dictating the writing of Hong Kong art history or Hong Kong history in general right now. Um, and Local Chinese have actually been extremely active in publishing in Chinese. It's just whether um, Western scholars have um, bothered to read them or not, that's a different question. So, I mean, I personally feel like growing up, I read a lot of history written by uh, Hong Kong Chinese as well as um, Westernized Chinese or, or British expats um, teaching in, in, in Hong Kong. So a uh, quick summary, um, this is um, stolen from a uh, historian, Vaudin Eng England, who's been uh, great in summarizing uh, Hong Kong historiography into three schools. So first of all, we can talk about the colonial school, people who glorify, you know, the, the sort of um, uh, British um, methods of, you know, uh, modernizing Hong Kong, which was just a fish fishing village and nothing more than that. Um, and then you get the sort of Marxist um, post-1949 Beijing-centric uh, view, um, and they follow the narrative of colonial exploitation and oppression um, and, and seeing the Chinese ex as, as pure victims um, of this uh, opium war and, and everything that was going on at the time. So this is a view from uh, Beijing and not from Hong Kong itself. And then now I think recently we really see the rise of what we call the Hong Kong school. So they're neither sort of pro-colonial or pro-Beijing. And we're really going back to uh, archives in Hong Kong, speaking to people there, you know, Eurasian um, communities, um, Southeast Asian communities. Um, we're talking about labor unrest that happened, um, the complex rule of law, how the British law did not really apply, um, or the... the rights of uh, being a British um, citizen um, did not particularly apply to a lot of Hong Kong citizens. So it's a, there's a lot of complex research happening um, based in Britain, based in um, Hong Kong, um, and in America as well. 
Now, as a PhD student at SOAS right now, I am trying to record the history of collecting Chinese art in Hong Kong, which hasn't really been researched properly yet. And I have had some challenges and some pushback from people who say, why are you writing this? There's no collecting history in Hong Kong. It was just a temporary thing. Um, people needed a, a place to keep their, their, their art collections you know, in light of the Cultural Revolution and, and because Hong Kong was a unique uh, situation for the art market. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see that you still get a lot of this kind of out, outdated kind of um, ideas that Hong Kong is not worth writing about. It's just a, a particular place stuck in a particular time and it's all over now. Um, so this is what has been done um, on, you know, histories of collecting Chinese art. Um, you know, there's a huge amount of research done on Euro European and American collections of Chinese art. But what I'm really trying to tackle is um, these people, these collectors and dealers and advisors who are active um, in China and in Hong Kong. So I guess my research is really part of this effort to decolonize or to um, bring out more pluralistic voices. Um, so one example is I'm looking at uh, a collector dealer. His name was Edward Chow. Um, and he was one of the um, very uh, respected um, connoisseurs, if you like, um, from Shanghai. So he actually set up his business in Shanghai and started collecting um, in the 1930s, um, 1940s. And then he went to Hong Kong in 1949. Um, and in Hong Kong, he had a huge number of um, publishing opportunities available to him. So I'm thinking about you know, Hong Kong as a very important hub for publishing at the time, um, especially um, you know, in the 50s and the 60s, um, there was a, a thriving business for, for, for printing and the press in Hong Kong. So um, he actually published his, uh, the catalogs for his private collection for the first time in Hong Kong uh, when he had the resources to do so. Um, and what I'm doing is also going through his um, unpublished memoir, which is written in Chinese. And even as someone who reads Chinese, it takes a lot of effort to dissect this because he writes in very sort of uh, messy, cursive writing. Um, so this is very much what, what I'm trying to do. And um, it's... It's interesting to see um, that Hong Kong has actually benefited from a lot of publishing opportunities. There's a lot of um, publications um, with the universities there. Um, and I think it's, it's great that Hong Kong as a very bilingual place um, has, has always done a lot with translating English texts into Chinese and vice versa. So for instance, if you look at the publications by the Hong Kong Museum of Art, a lot of them are, are bilingual, um, and the collector societies in Hong Kong who have the best, um, you know, the, the, the important collections, um, they always make sure they have things published in Chinese um, as well as English. But obviously, um, this needs to continue, I think, especially um, after the handover to, to China in 1997. Um, People obviously prioritize learning Mandarin over English now for a lot of um, the younger generation. Um, so when we publish, do we publish in traditional Chinese that caters for Hong Kong and Taiwanese audience? Do we publish in simplified Chinese that cater for a mainland Chinese audience? Uh, do we bother translating into English anymore? Um, do people care about um, uh, Western acknowledgement, um, especially when it comes to Chinese art? I think there's a sort of sense of arrogance sometimes that um, the research is now coming from Beijing and Shanghai. Why do we need to read um, the English text? And um, it's, it's very interesting how things are actually changing every day and how um, a lot of English books are being um, translated into Chinese to cater for the Chinese market now. So I open up those questions and um, I'm going to keep this short, and that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker will have uh, Scott Redford. Please.
I have no PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, so uh, may I sit here and, and speak? Do I, do I have to hold this thing in my hand? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Is it a sacred uh, <laughs> conch shell or something like that? Pass from speaker to speaker. Okay, thank you. Um, my title. Do I? What do I do with this? Put it in your pocket. How's that? Okay. So, um, if you look at the title of my presentation, um, you will see that it has three terms there, and that's basically the structure of this this presentation. So two points before we begin. Uh, uh, first of all, this is a very broad brush presentation because I am talking about a, an area from the Atlantic all the way through Central Asia, so obviously people will be thinking of exceptions. The second point I want to make is in the context of this workshop, uh, I, um, I want to highlight what I will be talking, a term I will be using in my presentation, I'm sure has been used late, early on, which is uh, essentialism, essentialist, things like that. Uh, so everybody knows that uh, the Alpha Wood Foundation does not, is not interested in the Islamic world, right? There is a particular remit, and I just want to raise, um, without knowing why this happened or how it happened, that I consistently have students in my classes who want to study Islam in, in South, South, Southeast Asia. Um, for whatever reason, um, I am not qualified to teach this. I will not talk about this in my presentation, but before I start, I want to throw this out uh, as a topic that I think is, uh, is of interest and that I wish we could teach at SOAS, either within or without any other structure that is present uh, now. So, Orientalism. If we define Orientalist in the root sense of the word and not the sense as used by Edward Said, it means somebody literally who studies the Orient. And in early modern uh, Europe, this means generally the Islamic world. At the time, the world is not divided by language, but it's divided by religion or creed, if you want. And of course, this is when period when religions are invented, right? Famously, Hinduism becomes a, a religion um, in the 18th and 19th century. In Europe, studies of the Islamic world began and ended with Arabic. Arabic is the language of the Islamic holy book of the Quran, of course, and language and religion are imbricated in Islam in ways they cannot be in Christianity. Christianity with its multiple linguistic frames of Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin, etc. So as Orientalism developed in the 19th century, Islamic languages came to be taught and studied in a fashion similar to the way classical languages are studied, were studied, and are studied uh, in Europe. We all know that the 18th century was a time in which, in addition to Christianity, Greco-Roman civilization was promoted as the basis for something that is called, was called, and is called Western civilization. The hegemony of Greek over Latin, Greek with its antiquity and sanctity, provided a calc for the continued dominance of the study of Arabic over that of any other second uh, or third or fourth Islamic language. Current academic study of the Islamic world continues in many ways to privilege the Arabic language and material culture associated with Arabs as original and therefore more authentic, there's that word, uh, than those uh, of other Islamic peoples uh, and cultures. If there was a second Islamic language, it's Persian. This is due to two major reasons. Uh, one of them is the discovery of the, the Indo-European language group in the 19th century and the realization that Persian belonged to this language group. Uh, so people privileged Persian because it was, one, it was a language, it was related to European languages. The second reason is the use of Persian as the administrative language of the Mughal Empire. So as British colonialism uh, set, its, uh, set up shop uh, in the subcontinent, Persian became a language, uh, which we don't think of it now, as the dominant language that you needed to learn uh, to be uh, in, uh, in India. And just to open and close a parenthesis here, if you want to talk about the decolonization of SOAS, it might uh, someday extend to the library classification system. 
of Soas's library, uh, in which if you're interested in a book on Afghanistan, it's considered to be part of South Asia, uh, and not Central Asia, and not the Islamic world. Uh, something I find uh, a, a, a callback to the, uh, to the great game, of course, and the position of Afghanistan uh, in relationship uh, to the Russian sphere. Despite the fact that the Ottoman Empire, which was largely Turkish speaking, was the largest, nearest Islamic state to Europe, the study of Turkish was a distant third to Arabic and Persian. In the 19th and 20th centuries, European colonial powers contented themselves with aiding uh, revolutions or lopping up those parts of the, of the Ottoman Empire that were that, to the West that were predominantly Christian, uh, or of course the parts that were predominantly Arab. Uh, away from some sort of a, a Turkic core. It's really only in my generation, in the last 30 years, that people have taken the study of Turkish, the Ottoman Empire, seriously. Other, before that, it was derivative, doubly derivative, from Persian and before that, uh, Arabic. So this is a really interesting moment, actually, uh, for uh, the study of the Ottoman Empire and the Turkish language. France had served as the main guarantor of Christians living in the Ottoman Empire, so French became the European language of Christian Arabs, as well as through the establishment of Francophone Alliance Israelite schools in the 19th century Jewish communities. And French colonial rule in North Africa means that French continues to dominate the study of Islamic North Africa today. I went to the Louvre a few years ago to give a lecture and I was invited to the Sorbonne after, to afterwards to meet Islamic art students, and we went around the room and they introduced themselves. Everybody was either from North Africa or studying North Africa, with only two exceptions, and those were people who were from the part of the world that they were studying uh, in Paris. I'm exaggerating for effect, uh, but that's, uh, I think, still more or less the, the situation uh, today. And it's interesting to see that it's not concomitant with the colonial relationship uh, between India uh, and Britain. While Indian studies in many respects are, are doing well in this country, there's not that intimate relationship that I, I have seen, at least, in Paris. I don't know if Ashley agrees with that or not. With the establishment of European scholarly research institutes in colonial territories, previous colonial arrangements continue. It is only in Iran that the relationship between national schools, that is French, English, and German, and long-standing excavations has been broken. All foreign archeological projects in Iran are now collaborative ones with local universities. And the trend continues. There is a panel scheduled for the annual meeting of the British Association of Near Eastern Archeology span in Oxford next January. And the title of this panel is Still Digging? With a question mark. Uh, and that question mark only has partially to do with the rise of technologies that have to do with, of course, a remote sensing as being more important than uh, what is now called ground truthing, uh, which is an amazing term, I think, in the, of the last 10 years, at least for me, uh, the reversal, uh, the role of uh, getting your spade in, into the ground, as opposed to taking a satellite picture of a LIDAR radar uh, uh, sense of it. So um, non-national field research expeditions to countries that traditionally hosted them in the Islamic world may be coming to an end. With the exception of Germany, the very existence of European research institutes in Islamic countries, at least, may be in question. And the British Academy has been slashing the, uh, the already minimal um, budgets that are given to uh, British research institutes uh, everywhere, actually, but also in the Islamic world. So I, it's my guess that within a decade, there will only be two British uh, overseas research institutes. They will be in those exotic countries of Italy and Greece. <laughs> Back to the origins of Greco-Roman civilization. Uh, and you have to remember that we have to trade with the world, right? This is a period uh, when Britain is, is, wants to open up and break those bonds, uh, or some people want to break those bonds alleged bonds uh, with Europe. So will the EU step in to fund EU-wide research institutes in Islamic countries with an aim both to increase US, EU soft power 
and move beyond the shadow of uh, colonialism? That's another question mark, and it remains to be seen. Now, in the world of Islamic art and archaeology, it's still the norm for European and North American scholars not to know a modern Islamic language well enough either to converse in it or lecture in it, let alone publish in it. In archaeology departments in Western Europe and North America, you can see my archaeological bias to this presentation. In archaeology departments, it is not normal for archaeologists to know the language of the country they are working in. For this reason, SOAS's Department of the History of Art and Archaeology is not considered an archaeology department by other UK archaeology departments. One British archaeologist said to me, uh, it, we consider it to be a regional study center with sarcasm dripping from her lips as she said it. It's not a place where you can study uh, archaeology. Uh, as, as recently as 10 years ago, a prominent Western Islamic archaeologist proposed a scholarly journal on Islamic material culture that would only contain articles and references in those articles in Western languages. And I kid you not, that was only 10 years ago. In addition to inheritances from Orientalist and colonial epistemological structures, there are the limitations of the modern nation state. And that's where I'd like to end my presentation. After the 1979 revolution in Iran, which was, after all, a religious uh, revolt, knowledge of Arabic in Iran has declined. In Turkey, the national narrative is imperative to all work. The main Islamic museum in Turkey, after all, is not called an Islamic museum. It's called the Museum of Turkish and Islamic Art, uh, with the ethnic aspect uh, that's privileged. It, when you go to, um, uh, to Istanbul today, uh, you can see other religious uh, developments, but we don't have no time to get into those. And in the Arab world, there are plenty of national journals but there's no international journal of Islamic art and archaeology in Arabic. In the former territories of the Soviet Union, a younger generation has largely abandoned Russian as a scholarly language, but without a clear preference for publishing in English or any other Western European language. So despite this fragmented picture, it's pretty clear that the purpose of national journals and the publications of state organs like museums and academies in, in most Islamic countries, uh, the purpose of this is to foster nationalist narratives above uh, religious, you know, so pan-Islamic religious narratives, despite the way Islam is being presented to us uh, in the media. With growing populations, dwindling resources, rampant economic development, and new universities being funded pretty much everywhere in the Islamic world, largely as a function of political patronage, these local journals and books serve largely to record and not interpret data, as Ashley talked about in her presentation uh, this afternoon. Even with the rise of Islamist movements in much of the region, the dominant narrative, I repeat to sum up, the dominant narrative is not pan-Islamist, but nationalist. Thank you very much. Day. Thank you, Noel. So the title uh, I gave was Publishing in Chinese and English in China, Greater China and the Anglophone World. And the, the uh, I mean, decolonization revol involves um, reflexivity. So I guess uh, in contrast with Scott's uh, very polished uh, presentation, this is more extemporary and is more of a, I guess it's a kind of selfie of me, a figurative selfie of me within the publishing world of Chinese art history. So I was very struck by the, the binary um, Ashley uh, raised, which Scott just alluded to, between a kind of empirical um, reportage mode of publishing in contrast with Western 
analytical or synthetic um, uh, approaches. It strikes me when you add China to the mix, you, you get another kind of binary or, or, or dialectic. That's it's basically I ideological. So in China, in mainland China at least, you, you're dealing with a, a Marxist or a Chinese communist, uh, even a, you know, all sorts of words you could use, a post-socialist, a kind of command model at least. And that seems to, is, is uh, there's some friction currently up against a kind of neoliberal capitalist model of the West. So when it comes to decolonization, you're dealing in, with China, at least, with, a, with one, another one of these ethno-nationalisms that we've um, been alluding to. Uh, you know, the, the Chinese state promotes the idea of 5,000 years of unbroken Chinese history and consanguinity, which is an extraordinary claim to make it, on top of the, um, uh, the historical one. So this has huge implications for how archaeology is presented in publishing in China, but also historical modeling. Um, there's, there's a, you know, it's a command model which begins with slave society and it ends with this kind of sunny uplands of a glorious socialist future. Uh, that's that's the, the trajectory. Now, No uh, used this interesting term of a, a two-world problem. And again, I mean, I, when it comes to this construction of knowledge that is China, uh, I, I'm struck by the idea of multiple Chinas. And Ivy alluded also to the idea you've got traditional Chinese, the Hong Kong version of it, the Taiwan version of it, and then all the pre-modern texts that you read that have not been translated into simplified Chinese. And then you've got simplified Chinese in the PRC, in Singapore, and then all the pre-modern texts that have been translated into simplified Chinese. And you could also include in this mix Japanese who are highly literate who can read Chinese, or Koreans, or even Vietnamese who are part of the Sinosphere, who are all kind of part of this construction of multiple Chinas. So when it comes to oneself, um, a number of, well, at least two Chinese artists have said to me that they think they knew me in a past life when I was Chinese. So <laughs> I, I make no claim. And I haven't done a DNA test, but from this, from this pale face, I think you can guess that I'm pretty much European, which means that I am likely to be somewhere between 5 and 12% Neanderthal, because most uh, white Europeans have got that percentage of Neanderthal. So I'm not entirely human. A little, little bit of something else here. Um, but anyway, I'm sitting here mainly as a specialist in... Uh, Chinese art history, who publishes mainly on uh, painting and calligraphy, also a little bit on uh, ceramics, visual culture, and I also have another sideline in curating contemporary art. Trained in the UK and the USA, I have worked in the UK, Ireland, USA, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and in mainland China as well. So, yeah, I've got about a bit. Now, publishing... I've mainly published in English until now. In the last three or four years, various projects that I have done have, have managed to produce bilingual publications. So this is a catalog of a contemporary art exhibition that I did in um, Shanghai. So this has a kind of commercial gallery behind it. They produced a beautiful bilingual uh, edition. Uh, I have uh, sitting on my desk, burning a hole in it, this is the uh, Chinese translation of a monograph that I produced in English about 10 years ago, full of problems. I don't know when that is going to come out. The translation is appalling. Uh, so I, I don't know what, what I can do about that. I have also actually published, I mean, I've often tried, if I've worked with someone from China, to put their name on the catalog to recognize it as a collaborative effort. So this is a exhibition of a catalogue of an exhibition in Dublin, uh, so co-authored with um, the curator from the Shanghai Museum, and uh, I thought it would do him some good. It, it evidently has, because he's now the head of the department and possibly a future director, so it made me even more glad to have put his name on that. Um, but some of the... Uh, I mean, for some of these projects, especially this kind of uh, academic uh, tome, to publish that in Chinese, I, I really have to rely strongly on 
like former doctoral students or other collaborators in China. And for them, there's an urgency. There's a need that this should look good. It, it reflects badly on them if I don't come across uh, well in China. This is very different from, say, in Japan, where books are translated by someone of your same status. So eminent professors in Japan would translate the work by eminent professors, or mid-ranking professors would be translated by someone of a equivalent rank. Not at all like that in China. The, the, the job of the translator is pretty uh, low status, unfortunately, and that's partly why there, there are these issues with it. There is also a real difficulty for, in being the one and the same person who writes in English and in Chinese. And if, to give the example of my teacher, Wen Fong, he would have had a classical education in China, left China in 1949. He was also a prodigy of calligraphy, uh, but published everything in English and couldn't write in Chinese in spite of that background. So, I mean, how much more unlikely is it that I'm ever going to write something in Chinese or even be able to edit it in Chinese? It's just uh, not going to happen. And actually, when I go to China now, in some places, they don't want me to lecture in Chinese. They would much rather I lecture in English and provide a translator, which is actually very, it's quite an irritating thing. Uh, but um, there, there, there it is. Um, so um, I think, I mean, maybe my last point before I kind of, I'm going to present a series of initiatives around what I see as some initiatives around uh, decolonization. So the last real point would be just to think about you know, um, dealing with China and the censorship uh, regime. So translating into simplified Chinese is not simply a question of one language to another. It's, it's one ideological world into another. And it involves the removal of all kinds of references or ideas. So, here are my four, for what they're worth, initiatives for uh, dealing with this issue of decolonizing in the publishing world of Chinese art history. The first one is we still have to engage. We have to hold the line with academic freedom uh, by publishing in Chinese and do it just doing the best that we can, holding out to do the very best that we can. All of the Western scholars who publish in Chinese art history are very, very closely followed in China. They know who everyone is, and uh, the atmosphere of study in universities is almost febrile, the, the, the degree to which people are looking at this thing. But they still have quite limited access to uh, Anglophone publications in Libraries, for example, if a dignitary or if a high official is coming, they will often cover the non-Chinese books so that they're not seen by official X of this level, just to protect themselves. Uh, that's, that's the kind of climate you've got. Um, my second... Um, so essentially what I'm saying is we must engage... Even though there will be censorship, we have to find ways to try and mitigate the worst uh, elements of it and live with it, but we've got to publish. So my second initiative is to facilitate others doing the same. And uh, I, for example, have a publisher from uh, a top university in China is coming on Friday. She wants to meet to talk about publishing uh, Anglophone monographs on Chinese art history published by SOAS staff and she wants to publish them in Chinese with her university press. This is something I think we definitely have to facilitate. My third um, uh, initiative is to anticipate and support. And I'm thinking here of bilingual publishing. I think this has been mentioned earlier. I think this is definitely something that's going to happen more. One of my former doctoral students is quite interested in this, and whenever I see her, I kind of will say, how's that going? Let's, let, you know, what can we do? Uh, so to move beyond the idea, the idea, the current sort of standard of just having a title and an abstract in Chinese, which isn't widespread in the Anglophone journals in North America, for example, you think of Artibus Asiae or Ar um, Archives of Asian Art or these ones, they don't have uh, the other language or the, 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 the likely other language um, included there. And, and my fourth uh, uh, initiative is to... Um, is to uh, is basically in advocacy. So this means that if 
I spot a book published in Chinese that I think is a really, really good book and should be published in English, then I have to try and find a way for that to happen. And luckily enough, the, the last one that, that occurred to me, um, I wrote to the person and said, this is such a good book, I really want to see this in English. And he wrote straight back and said, oh yeah, someone just wrote to me yesterday and it's already in train. So that was, was really wonderful to know. So those are my uh, four initiatives. And I will finish it there. Thank you. Right, so which one, which one is the underling? I think it's um, both. Yeah. It's really both. So when, when, I, uh, when Shane reached out to me about this decolonizing workshop, I mean, I never really decided what I thought about this whole concept because from a Hong Kong perspective, it wasn't so much of a dichotomy. It was never really like that, like really living there and being there. Whereas I guess if you were just reading books and so on, like in English, then maybe you see a different, you have a different idea of it. But um, I really do feel like there were, so for instance, I was going through a lot of archival documents in the Museum of Art in Hong Kong for the establishment. They had they invited a lot of advisors who were Westerners, uh, sort of British, sort of curators, et cetera. But then somewhere down the line in the 70s and, 70s and 80s, they started really asking more sort of um, Chinese people uh, who had come from the mainland for, to get their advice. And their, their advice would only be written in Chinese, and then someone with a secretary would translate for him. Um, and I do feel like there was respect for, for the Chinese written word just as much as um, the English written word. So um, I don't feel like it was really like someone. It just strikes me that there's a specificity of Hong Kong. Um, maybe you could protect this from Singapore in a light mm -hmm. way, I don't know, of a, a perfect bilingual. Right, that would enable uh, a kind of neutralization of hierarchies in some way. Yeah, it's, it's difficult though, because there's always, um, there are always scholars who prefer to publish in one specific language. I think Hong Kong has been great in making sure that things get translated, you know, very often or from, from practically speaking more often than other places. Um, but I do feel like people do have one preference, and I think there are a lot of places where the languages are compromised. So if you write in both languages, one language has, tends to be not as well written as the other. Um, and it's, I think it's really quite impossible to get someone who can write in both languages um, immaculately. I mean, I, I know um, that I, I'm very good at translating and knowing how to make things sound right. I've taken on a lot of that book translation projects. Um, but you know, it, a lot of it is finding the right people to ask you as well, um, knowing who, who will give you the right terms. Um, because it, it, it's, it's basically impossible. And I work a lot with trying to find the right translators for the Chinese art in the both uh, switches. And it's really difficult. And I, and I always know, like, this translator can only do English to Chinese, this translator the other way around. Whereas people don't know that. People, there are a lot of people who say, can you get this translated? Person, but I know this person is better from A to B, not being paid. So. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. A little factoid, um, Richard Hughes, who you cited in your very first day, is a very interesting man, mm -hmm. not, not very uh, representative British imperialism. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was an Australian Marxist, he was a friend of Mao and Ho Chi Minh, and did his best through the years to report everything from their point of view. That's really interesting because he's always seen by contemporary. 
basically Hong Kong historians as um, someone who just sort of scraped the surface. And, and I think people like John Carroll um, or um, that, you know, there are a few other people who are also sort of um, Westerners based in Hong Kong, but who are really giving a more uh, wider perspective on things. So, so with what John Carroll has been doing, he's um, talking a lot about um, Hong Kong people who collaborated with the British government, um, not necessarily being exploited by them, but um, you know, different perspectives on the on the same thing. But I, I have to say, Richard Hughes is also not a very kind of like um, serious historian. He was kind of like a journalistic approach, so we can't be too harsh on like what he's he was trying to portray at the time. Um, but um, you know, obviously his his text is still you know a classic, I think, and, and his phrase. Um, borrowed place, borrowed time is really was, stuck in a lot of times. It was really an early version of the decolonizing mm. of, of Europe, China, and, mm. and North Vietnam. Mm. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to yeah. escape, I'm very can sorry. I really, oh, really uh, appreciated, Christina, you're bringing up this um, issue of national languages, because it, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, a sort of a self-evident language in which to translate English or French or whatever um, other colonizing language. Um, and um, when in the case of the Philippines, for instance, what the, you know, Filipino is a made up, you know, or Tagalog is a made up national language, and there are these other languages such as, you know, Kapampangan or Ilocano or whatever, um, then choosing one language is, in fact, you know, uh, veering towards another kind of internal colonization, if you were, as you were. Same with Chinese, right? Are we going to translate to Tibetan, to Uyghur, and so on, um, depending on what the uh, subject um, matter is? So I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, to the other, um, um, well, um, to also to the chair, whether this is the case in other Southeast Asian languages as well. Thank you. Well, my guiding principle is for, for uh, providing a, a second language, the guiding principle was to just be accessible to the, to the local community to which the research was affected. Uh, and so if I went to this community and I did research there and I published something, I would be able to go back then to them and give them something in their own language that they could tell. So that was that was the guiding principle. Okay. And somebody else? Uh, maybe, maybe I'll say something in closing because I know that people are closing, so I'll come up with some of the response to that that closes this. Um, and, and it does seem to me that a lot of the talk has been about internal colonization, and it's really, it's really useful that you brought that up. Um, the not only languages, um, we could certainly get to the question of um, many languages in Southeast Asia which um, colonize other smaller languages in Southeast Asia, and that's part of the part of uh, some of the questions that you raise as well, um, Scott. But um, but also, if we go back to one of the examples from our um, from our first panel, uh, Pipat's uh, discussion about what he calls mainstream art history and non-mainstream art history. So there's a certain kind of internal colonization which isn't articulated through uh, a differentiation of language use, but which is articulated through different publishing venues. And those kinds of challenges that are certainly at work and which aren't always recognized, I think, in, uh, let's go back to the Southeast Asian example, in Western scholarship in Southeast Asia. So folks will go and see if they're at all ethically oriented. They'll go and look at what's going on and see if that's going on. Uh, publishing the news, but not necessarily elsewhere. So that seems to me to be a, a sort of important issue to follow up on. Um, I would like to take this opportunity with my conch shell to, um, to thank everybody, um, including our last panelists. Thank you especially to Noelle for um, not only opening our day, but closing our day. We really appreciate your work. And um, to thank all of you for, for coming. Uh, and please join us for a reception outside. Thank you.